This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Voodoo Planet by Andre Norton. Chapter 3 You are truly a man of power. Tao shook his head in answer to that outburst from Asaki. Not so, sir. Your Lumbrilo is a man of power. I drew upon his power, and you saw the results. Deny it not. What we saw never walked this world. Tao slung the strap of a trail-bag over his shoulder. Sir, once men of your blood, men who bred your race, hunted the elephant. They took his tusks for their treasure, feasted upon his flesh yes, and died beneath the trampling of his feet when they were unlucky or unwary. So there is that within you which can even now be awakened to remember El Dama in his might when he was king of the herd, and need fear nothing save the spears and cunning of small weak men. Lumbrilo had already awakened your minds to see what he willed you to see. "'How does he do this?' asked the other simply. Is it magic that we see not Lumbrilo but a lion before us? He weaves his spell with the drums, with the chant, by the suggestion his mind imposes upon yours, and having woven his spell, he cannot limit it to just the picture he suggests, if ancient racial memories raise another. I merely use the tools of Lumbrilo to show you yet another picture your people once knew well and in so doing made an enemy. Asaki stood before a rack of very modern weapons. Now he made his selection, a silver tube with a stock curved to fit a man's shoulder. Lembrilo will not forget. Tao laughed shortly. No, but then I have merely done as you wished, have I not, sir? I have focused on myself the enmity of a dangerous man and now you hope I shall be forced, in self-defense, to remove him from your path." The Kotkin turned slowly, resting the weapon across his forearm. I do not deny that, spaceman. Then matters are indeed serious. They are so serious, Asaki interrupted, speaking not only to Tao, but to the other off-worlders as well that what happens now may mean the end of the Katka that I know. Lumbrilo is the most dangerous game I have faced in a lifetime as a hunter. He goes, or we draw his fangs, or else all that I am, all I have labored here to build, will be swept away. To preserve this I will use any weapon. And I am now your weapon, which you hope will be as successful as that needler you are carrying. Tao laughed again, without much humor. Let us hope I shall prove as effective. Jellico moved out of the shadows. It was just after dawn, and the grayness of the vanishing night still held in the corners of the armory. Deliberately, he took his own stand before the arms racks and chose a short-barreled blaster. Only when its butt was cupped in his hand did he glance at his host. We came guesting, Asaki. We have eaten salt and bread under this roof. On my body and my blood it is, returned the Kotkin grimly. I shall go down to the blackness of Sabra before you do, if the flames of death are against us. From his belt he flipped loose his knife and offered the hilt to Jellico. My body for a wall between you and the dark, Captain. But also understand this. To me, what I do now is greater than the life of any one man. Lumbrilo and the evil behind him must be rooted out. There was no trickery in my invitation." They stood eye to eye, equal in height, in authority of person, and that indefinable something which made them both masters in their own different worlds. Then Jellicoe's hand went out, his fingertip flicked the hilt of the bared blade. There was no trickery, he conceded. I knew that your need was great when you came to the Queen. 
since both the captain and Tao appeared to accept the situation, Dane, not quite understanding it all, was prepared to follow their lead. And for the moment they had nothing more in plan than to visit the Zaboru Preserve. They went by Flitter, Asaki, one of his hunter-pilots, and the three from the Queen, lifting over the rim of mountains behind the fortress palace, and speeding north with the rising sun a flaming ball to the east. Below the country was stark, rocks and peaks, deep purple shadows marking the veins of crevices. But that was swiftly behind, and they were over a sea of greens, many shades of green, with yellow, blue, even red cutting into the general verdant carpet of treetops. Another chain of heights and then open land, swales of tall grass already burnt yellow by the steady sun. There was a river here, a crazy, twisted stream, coiling nearly back upon itself at times. Once more broken land, land so ravished by prehistoric volcanic action that it was a grotesque nightmare of erosion-whittled outcrops and mesas. Asaki pointed to the east. There was a dark patch widening out into a vast wedge. The Swamp of Migra. It has not yet been explored. You could air-map it, Tao began. The chief ranger was frowning. Four flitters have been lost trying that. Calm reports fail when they cross that last mountain ridge eastward. There is some sort of interference, which we do not yet understand. Migra is a place of death. Later we may be able to travel along its fringe, and then you shall see. Now he spoke to the pilot in his own tongue, and the flitter pointed up-nose at an angle as they climbed over the highest peak they had yet seen in this mountainous land, to reach at last a country of open grass dotted with small forest stands. Jellico nodded approvingly. Zaboru? Zaboru, Asaki assented. We shall go up to the northern end of the preserve. I wish to show you the roosts of the fastals. This is their nesting season, and the site is one you will long remember. But we shall take an eastern course. I have two ranger stations to check on the way. It was after they left the second station that the flitter swung farther out eastward, again climbing over the chain of heights, to sight one of the newly discovered wonders the staff at the last station had reported, a crater lake and the flitter skimmed down across the water which was a rich emerald in hue, filling the crater from one rock wall to the other with no beach at the foot of those precipitant cliffs. As the machine arose to clear the far wall, Dane tensed. One of his duties aboard the Queen was flitter pilot for planet-wise trips, and ever since they had taken off that morning he had unconsciously flown with the Kotkin pilot, anticipating each change or adjustment of the controls. Now he felt that sluggish response to the other's lift signal, and instinctively his own hand went out to adjust a power feed lever. They made the rise, were well above the danger of the cliff wall. But the machine was not responding properly. Dane did not need to watch the pilot's swiftly moving hands to guess that they were in trouble and his slight concern deepened into something else, as the flitter began to drop nose again. In front of him, Captain Jellico shifted uneasily, and Dane knew that he, too, was alerted. Now the pilot had plunged the power adjuster to the head against the control board. But the nose of the flitter acted as if it were overweighted or magnetically attracted by the rocks below. The best efforts of the man flying it could not keep it level. They were being drawn earthward, and all the pilot could do only delayed the inevitable crack-up. The Kotkin was turning the machine north to avoid what lay below, for here a long arm of the Migra swamp clasped about the foot of the mountain. The chief ranger spoke into the mic of the comm unit while the pilot continued to fight against the pull which was bringing them down. Now the small machine was below the level of the volcanic peak which cradled the lake, and the mountain lay between them and the preserve. Asaki gave a muffled exclamation, slapped the comm box, spoke more sharply into the mic. 
it was apparent he was not getting the results he wanted. Then, with a quick glance about, he snapped an order. Strap in. His Terran companions had already buckled the wide webbing belts intended to save them from crash shock. Dane saw the pilot push the button to release fen cushions. In spite of his pounding heart, a small fraction of his brain recognized the other's skill, as the Kotkin took a course to bring them down on a relatively level patch of sand and gravel. Dane raised his head from the shelter of his folded arms. The chief ranger was busy with the pilot, who lay limply against the controls. Captain Jellicoe and Tao were already pulling at the buckles of their protective crash belts. But one look at the front of the flitter told Dane that it would not take to the air again without extensive repairs. Its nose was bent up and back, obscuring the forward view completely. However, the pilot had made a miraculously safe landing, considering the terrain. Ten minutes later, the pilot restored to consciousness and the gash in his head bandaged, they held a council of war. The comm was off, too. I did not have a chance to report before the crash, Masaki put the situation straightly. And our exploring parties have not yet mapped this side of the range. It has a bad reputation because of the swamp. Jellicoe measured the heights now to their west with resigned eyes. Looks as if we climb. Not here, the chief ranger corrected him. There is no passing through the Crater Lake region on foot. We must travel south along the edge of the mountain area until we do find a scalable way into the preserve region. You seem very certain we are not going to be rescued if we stay right here, Tao observed. Why? Because I am inclined to believe that any flitter that tries to reach us may run into the same trouble. Also, they have no comm fix on us. It will be at least a day or more before they will even begin to count us missing, and then they will have the whole northern portion of the preserve to comb. There are not enough men here. I can give you a multitude of reasons, medic." "'One of which might be sabotage?' demanded Jellicoe. Asaki shrugged. "'Perhaps. I am not loved in some quarters. But there may also be something fatal to flitters here, as there is over Migra. We thought the Crater Lake district safely beyond the swamp influence, but it may not be so. But you took the chance of traveling over it, Dane thought, though he did not comment aloud. Was this another of the chief ranger's attempts to involve them in some private trouble of his own? though to deliberately smash up a flitter and set them all afoot in this wilderness was a pretty drastic move. Asaki had started to unload emergency supplies from the flitter. They each had a trail bag for a pack. But when the pilot staggered over to pull out a set of stas belts, and Jellicoe began to uncoil them, the chief ranger shook his head. With the feeder beam shut off by the mountains, I fear those will no longer work. Jellicoe tossed one on the crumpled nose of the flitter, and punched its button with the tip of the needler barrel. Then he threw a rock at the dangling belt. The stone landed, taking the wide protective band with it to the ground. That force field, which should have warded off the missile, was not working. Oh, fine. Tao opened his trail bag to pack concentrates. Then he smiled crookedly. We aren't signed in for killing licenses, sir. Do you pay our fines if we are forced to shoot a hole through something that disputes the right of way? To Dane's surprise, the chief ranger laughed. You are off preserve now, Medic Tau. The rules do not cover wild land, but I would suggest we now hunt a cave before nightfall. Lions? asked Jellicoe. Dane, remembering the black and white beast Lombrilo had presented, did not enjoy that thought. They had, his gaze went from man to man checking weapons, the needler Asaki carried, and another the pilot had slung by its carrying strap over his shoulder. Tao and the captain both were armed with blasters, and he had a fire ray and a force blade, both considered small arms, but deadly enough perhaps even to dampen a lion's enthusiasm for the chase. 
Lions, gras, rock apes. Asaki fastened the mouth of his trail bag. All are hunters or killers. The gras send out scouts, and they are big and formidable enough to have no enemies. Lions hunt with intelligence and skill. Rock apes are dangerous, but luckily they cannot keep silent when they scent their prey, and so give one warning. As they climbed upslope from the flitter, Dane, looking back, saw that perhaps Asaki was right in his belief that they had better try to help themselves rather than wait for rescue. Putting aside the excuse of fearing another crack-up, the wrecked flitter made no outstanding mark on the ground. The higher they climbed, the less it could be distinguished from the tumble of rocks about it. He had lagged a little behind, and when he hurried to catch up, found Jellico standing with his distance-vision lenses to his eyes, directing them toward that shadow marking the swamp. As the younger spaceman reached him, the captain lowered the glasses and spoke. Take your knife, Thorson, and hold it close to that rock, over there. He pointed to a rounded black knob protruding from the soil a little off their path. Dane obeyed, only to have the blade jerk in his hand, and when he loosened his hold in amazement, the steel slapped tight against the stone. Magnetic? Yes, which might explain our crash. Also this. Jellico held out a field compass to demonstrate that its needle had gone completely mad. "'We can use the mountain range itself for a guide,' Dane said, with more confidence than he felt. "'True enough. But we may have trouble when we head west again.' Jellico let the lenses swing free on their cord about his neck. "'If we were wrecked on purpose—' His mouth tightened, and the old blaster burn on his cheek stretched as did his jaw set. Then someone is going to answer a lot of questions, and fast. The chief ranger, sir? I don't know. I just don't know. The captain grunted as he adjusted his pack and started on. If fortune had failed them earlier, she smiled on them now. Asaki discovered a cave before sundown, located not too far from a mountain stream. The ranger sniffed the air before that dark opening as the hunter pilot shed his equipment and crept forward on his hands and knees, his head up and his nostrils expanding as he too tested the scent from the cave mouth. Scent? It was closer to a stench, and one ripe enough to turn the stomach of an off-worlder but the hunter glanced back over his shoulder and nodded reassuringly. Lion, but old. Not here within five days, at least. Well enough. And even old lion scent will keep away rock apes. We'll clean some, and then we can rest undisturbed, was his superior's comment. The cleaning was easy, for the brittle bedding of dried bracken and grass the beast had left burned quickly cleansing with both fire and smoke. When they raked the ashes out with branches, Asaki and Naimani brought in handfuls of leaves, which they crumpled and threw on the floor, spreading an aromatic odor which banished most of the foulness. Dane, at the stream with the canteens to fill, chanced upon a small pool, where there was a spread of smooth yellow sand. Knowing well the many weird booby traps one might stumble into on a strange world, the Terran prospected carefully, stirring up the sand with a stick. Sighting not so much as a water insect or a curious fish, he pulled off his boots, rolled up his breeches, and waded in. The water was cool and refreshing, though he dared not drink it until the purifier was added. Then, with the filled canteens knotted together by their straps, he put on his boots and climbed to the cave, where Tao waited with water tablets. Half an hour later, Dane sat cross-legged by the fire, turning a spit strung with three small birds a sake had brought in. One foot closer to the heat began to tingle, and he eased off his boot, his cramped toe suddenly seeming to have doubled in size. He was staring wide-eyed at these same toes, puffed, red, and increasingly painful to the touch, 
when Naimani squatted beside him, inspected his foot closely, and ordered him to take off his other boot. What is it? Dane found that shedding the other boot was a minor torture in itself. Naimani was cutting tiny splinters, hardly thicker than a needle, from a stick. Sandworm lays eggs in flesh. We burn them out or you have bad foot. Burn them out? Dane echoed, and then swallowed as he watched Naimani advance a splinter to the fire. Burn them, the Kotkin repeated firmly. Burn tonight, hurt some tomorrow. All well soon. No burn, very bad. Dane ruefully prepared to pay the consequences of his first brush with the unpleasant surprises Kotka had to offer. End of chapter 3